About 50 years ago, an astronaut returning from the moon experienced things that he couldn't find a scientific explanation for. So, with some colleagues, he launched a new science focused on the mind and how it works in the body and across space and time. It's the field of noetics, where the tools of modern science are used to help us understand how what we think and feel affects us and the world around us. Now, this is Dr. Ruth Miller's Noetic Moments from the studios of KXCR Community Radio in Florence, Oregon. And this is Noetic Moments, where we explore the field of research that discovers what consciousness is, what it does, how it works, and how our lives could be very different if we understood it better. I'm Ruth Miller, a longtime student of consciousness, cybernetics, and anthropology, and through this series of programs, I'm introducing some of the people whose work has defined this field of research, and I'll be explaining some of their ideas and their experiments. I'll also explore some relevant news items and answer questions that you send to my email address, ruth at noeticmoments.org, N-O-E-T-I-C, moments. It's been 10 months since we started exploring this research, and the first few months we're looking back at what was done in the early 20th century, and lately we've been looking at what's being done now. We learned in the process that most of what goes on in the mind is not in our conscious awareness at all, but goes on in unconscious processes. So our minds can be thought of as having three parts. What we're aware of, our personal awareness, what we aren't aware of that's keeping our bodies going, which also includes our beliefs about potential dangers and fears, and we can call that the individual subconscious, and what we aren't aware of that guides us in our actions, our ideals, which we can call the individual superconscious. We learned that we can change our state of consciousness and shift what we're aware of and capable of in the moment. We learned that while we can say where in the brain processes that direct the body are active, the responses in our body to both our individual mental activity and what's going on around us happen far faster than nerve impulses or chemicals can travel through the body, which means they aren't all originating in the brain. So it turns out that many scientists have come to accept that what we call mind is not the product of the electrochemical activity of the brain, but is, in fact, the activity of a kind of field that surrounds and permeates the body. That means that the brain is best understood as a receiver-transmitter or transponder, receiving messages from the mind and transmitting them to the body, and receiving messages from the senses and transmitting them to the body and the mind. We also learned that the brain modifies what it receives from the senses and from the mind to fit past patterns of experience that are stored as hardwired connections among the neurons. We learned that neurons that fire together over and over again wire together. Other experiments have demonstrated that what we call the individual mind continues to function even when the brain and heart are flatlined and the person is declared dead. Mind continues to perceive and process for as much as several hours before the brain and heart can be returned to functioning again, which may be why most reports of that period in people's experience do not fit past patterns of their experience that have been stored in the brain's neuronal connections. Mind, then, is a field, a pattern of informed energy that exists prior to and after the body is functioning as the superconscious. It develops with the body and brain as the subconscious and is being told by the brain what the world out there is like, our personal awareness. 
A field has a unique pattern of vibration that makes it different from other fields, and some experiments have demonstrated that people and animals who have minds that are vibrating along the same patterns are able to sense when one or the other is focusing attention on them or about to come home. Their minds share information, and their bodies change when someone they're connected with turns their attention their way. Beyond all that, we've seen that mind affects matter, starting with the basic building blocks of the universe, which show up as energy or matter depending on whether a mind is present to observe them, as demonstrated in the famous double-slit experiments in quantum physics, which helps us to understand how bodies and environments can shift and change as people change their thought processes. Based on all of that, a growing number of scientists are seeing our individual field of consciousness, or mind, as part of a larger field, a human noosphere, a global brain, a collective consciousness. And more and more scientists are equating that larger field with the quantum or zero-point field out of which all matter and energy arise in the orderly system we call the universe. This research has also demonstrated that it's possible for us individually and collectively to enter a state of consciousness in which all the body systems are in harmony with that mind field of ours, a state of coherence in which we feel peace and quiet joy, which then affects our own experience and the nature of the world around us. We've learned then that our personal experience is a product of mental and emotional processes, which happen in a field that surrounds and permeates our bodies and are transmitted through the brain and directly to smaller fields or organs or energy centers in the body. There they are turned into the words and thoughts and nerve signals and hormones that affect the body's state and activity. And there we can feel the various states of consciousness we operate from, and we can choose to enter a state of coherence that makes it possible for us to literally transform the material experience around us. And the more we can be aware of what's been going on in the interface between mind and brain and between brain and body, the healthier and more effective we can be. You can catch up on our past shows on the kxcr.net archives. If you don't see the button, click on the little cloud up on the banner at the top of the screen. And on our website, www.noeticmoments.org, where you'll also find links to the clips and books and authors that I mention on the show. Our focus today is how, knowing that our mind is not our brain, and that our brain filters messages from the mind and sends those messages to our bodies, how it is that thought can heal the body. A few months back, we talked about the fact that thousands of people over the past century and a half have experienced reduced or even eliminated symptoms by working with someone to change their beliefs and fill their minds with a new kind of thinking. This week, we're going to listen to someone who's written a book about the way he did that for himself. His name is R. J. Spina, and he overcame paralysis and several other issues and healed his body. Here's his description of the process he used. It has to do with, first off, understanding that you're not the body. So, because if we think we're the body, we've, we've already, we're building upon a, a false premise. And therefore, the, the likelihood of success is greatly reduced. So just the analogy is when we get in our car, we know we're not our car. If there's something wrong with the car, we just get it fixed. Plain and simple. Okay. So it's... Uh, That level of detachment is very helpful. So as I said, as a kid, I knew I wasn't the body. So I could, obviously, my body didn't work. I couldn't feel it. It was completely non-functional in a myriad of ways. So what I did was I would go to a higher state of consciousness. So if you think about going up in frequency or deeper and deeper into meditation, as another way of saying, because that's also true, at a certain point, Alex, you'd kind of reach what I call the etch-a-sketch level or where the form and function 
of the human vehicle is put together. And so when you start to access this through deeper states of meditation, you can actually start to put yourself back together, literally and figuratively. Now, there were seven different exercises or protocols or however you want to say it that are in the book that I did uh, myself or with myself and that I've taught countless people that have achieved tremendous success in their own healing. So it is about simply accessing a much deeper or higher state of consciousness. And it is through opening up our higher mind and fully commanding our body of energy. If we bring all of our energy into a single pointedness of focus, the likelihood of that desire coming into manifestation is far greater because all of the energy is focused into one thing. So a simple way, if we have one goal, right? For whatever that goal is, it doesn't even matter what the goal is. But if we put all of our attention, all of our focus and all of our energy on this one thing, most of us know that that thing has a far greater chance of actually happening because we're so focused on it. We're not getting distracted by anything else. Well, healing in a lot of ways works the same way. I was completely and utterly committed while in a higher state of consciousness of commanding the regeneration and revitalization of my body. And the book literally lines up the seven things that I did over and over and over again. And it's not anything that, uh, that only I can do, or this is nonsense. Metaphysics are metaphysics. And so I'm just blessed and also with a a tremendous responsibility to, to make sure that this comes forward in a way that everyone can understand it and apply it for themselves. He speaks of seven processes that he did over and over again, but his primary point is recognizing that we are not these bodies. We are not these brains. We are a mind that is functioning at higher levels or frequencies, as he said. And the way to access those higher frequencies, as he said, is through what we call meditation. A meditation happens many, many, many different ways. There are mind-filling meditations. There are mind-emptying meditations. There is sitting in a particular position, walking. But the concept is that you want to be in a state where what is going on is mind stuff, not that normal thought structure that goes on in the brain. So you are not playing over and over again, oh, did I do this? Oh, I should have done that. Oh, so-and-so is not okay. All those thoughts that have been going on over and over and replayed and replayed and wired your neurons. But to get out of that sequence of thoughts into something that is often called the silence or the stillness. But really, it's to distract the brain so that the mind can access directly what is going on in the body. Let me say that again. When we are meditating, what we are doing is distracting the brain so that the mind can work directly with the body without having to deal with that normal thought structure that has continually prevented us from seeing or feeling what it is the mind is offering. Now, if you have studied something called The Course in Miracles, what I'm doing here is very much similar to what the Course says when it says your ego is getting in the way and your spirit, the Holy Spirit, your higher self, is activating and ready to activate and to provide all that you have any need for, your fulfillment, your satisfaction, or as the Course often uses the term, your salvation. But the original meaning was fulfillment and satisfaction. If you've been to a unity or a religious science church, or perhaps a divine science church, or you've read any of their teachers, and there are a lot of them, then you may be aware that they've encouraged people to let go of, to release, to be done with all of the thoughts that are limiting and fearful, to find ways to release those and replace them with a new thought. That's why that group of traditions is the new thought. So then, this is what yogis are doing. This is what all of Transcendental Meditation is about. 
And what you are aiming for is to be so focused on whatever the focus is in transcendental meditation, it's the mantra, that, again, the mind can work directly with the body without the intervening process of the brain and all those neurons that have been wired together because you've been thinking the same thing over and over and over again or similar things. So that's the essence of what he's saying, to recognize that we are stepping outside of the belief and the experience of being the body, of being the thoughts, of being the brain-body connection. And then, from that place, begin to do processes that direct the body to be well and whole. Now, some of those processes are obviously going to be statements, and some of them are going to be visualizations, and some of them are going to be sensations of well-being and imagining and experiencing internally the final state of being able to do everything you want to do. So that's the beginning. Now, it's interesting because R.J. Spina does not consider his belief system to be part of the puzzle here. I'm going to contradict him a little bit because clearly his belief is that it's possible to step outside of your sense of self, your normal sense of self, and from that place, it's possible to do things that cause the body to heal. It's a very different belief system from anything most of us grew up with. But he believes he is suggesting that something else is going on here. And I think you'll be interested in it. So I'm going to let him speak again. So uh, the power of belief, right? The placebo effect. Knowing that you're supposed to get better by taking something has proven scientifically that it actually has an effect. You actually do get better if you believe that you're going to get better. Hence the placebo effect. The placebo effect is proof that we heal ourselves, clearly, because a sugar pill doesn't heal anybody of anything. Unless you so strongly believe that you're going to get better, you actually make yourself better. Okay. Now, Alex, I think the real key to understanding this is to go one step further. And, and hopefully the book is a, is, a, is a good teaching for this. Beliefs don't heal you. Healing occurs prior to belief. Okay. Belief. So, okay. Let me back up for a second. Desire and intention are the first two orders of creation itself. The order of creation itself is desire, intention, thought, emotion, action, and then behavior, okay? That is literally the order of creation. Now, desire and intention are higher frequencies. Higher frequencies are more potent and more powerful. So when we're operating from a true desire and intention state, which actually has nothing to do with thinking, the energy hasn't dropped down frequentially into thought, emotion, action, and behavior yet. So when you're operating in desire and intention state, you're operating at a higher frequency and you're operating in a more potent and powerful way. The placebo effect or through belief would be one notch below that as you start to enter into the thought realm, okay? Now, if you're fully invested in the thought that this is going to make you better, it has tremendous efficacy. But if you go a little quote unquote higher in frequency, into true desire and intention, and you don't even drop yourself down, you are operating in, an, in the most powerful way that you absolutely can, because desire and intention are the first two steps in the order of creation. So if you harness your desire and intention, and the book is all about this through a meditative state, if you harness your desire and intention properly in a higher consciousness state, you can do anything. The effect that this has on what we call matter is extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And use me as the, the first case study, if you like. So the spine doesn't self-heal. I made it heal, clearly. Now, the body has self-repair mechanism built into it. We get a cut, it scabs over. We all know this, right? Okay. Deeper, deeper levels like the spine have no self-repair and self-healing mechanism. But if the desire and the intention is strong enough and harnessed enough, and then by bringing these higher frequency and potent energies exactly by harnessing the desire and intention specifically to what it is that you want to achieve, matter then is greatly affected. 
Okay. So he recognizes that belief, if you believe that something is true, has a powerful effect. But he's helping us to operate beyond the level of the thoughts that are associated with belief. And I think many of us have had this experience. We are aware of an old history of believing something, but an event happens, maybe we fall in love, maybe something else happens, that we find ourselves functioning at a much higher frequency, a much higher level of consciousness than that belief system allows. And that lasts for a while. What it looks as if he's doing is encouraging us to find a way to normalize and intend being at the level of consciousness, the level of frequency, where what we are thinking and believing is not so important. And in that higher frequency, be able to make changes in that state of consciousness that is outside of our normal thinking awareness, what The Course in Miracles calls our ego, what other folks call our child self or our small self, that normal thought structure that has kept us locked in the repeating cycle over and over again. We want to get into a state of consciousness that is outside of that in order to undo the any disastrous effects, but it might also be to overcome any consequences of this returning pattern of thinking and the behaviors and the experiences that it evokes. I'm going to talk about his book. He calls the book Supercharged Self-Healing, A Revolutionary Guide to Access High-Frequency States of Consciousness that Rejuvenate and Repair. His name is R.J., the letters R.J., and his last name is Spina, S-P-I-N-A, which happens to be the Latin language for the word spine. Interesting that his spine was broken. The book is out in all forms. It came out last December, December of 2021, and it's available in all the usual places. The contents are kind of interesting. Part one. The Fundamentals of That Accelerated State of Being to Ascend the Frequencies Healing Technique. That's what he calls A-T-F-H-T, Ascend the Frequencies Healing Technique. So part two is Access Your True Essence. Two is uh, Step two is Know Specifically What You Are Going to Achieve. Step three is Activate Your Healing Intention. Step four, Command the Creator Consciousness. Step five, Channel Intelligent Energy into the Body. Step six, Turn Off the Program of Illness. And step seven, Use the Power of the Spoken Word. And his exercise includes Mantras for Healing. And then he has an appendix on fasting as it relates to turning off the program and a conclusion on how to maintain the new levels of harmony. What he was saying at the time is, my body is paralyzed, but what I am is not. This was the realization that allowed me to transcend limitations and enter a state of consciousness where I knew how to heal myself. And then he talks about half a dozen different diagnoses that are really nasty. And he says, when my neurosurgeon told my partner at that time, Jennifer, the infectious disease doctor, and me, about the chest down paralysis being permanent, I was completely calm. Instead of feeling horrified at what the expert told me, I was free. I was experiencing what lies beyond samadhi a term used to describe transcendence of the cycle of birth and death, I was in a state of grace and total liberation from the human condition. I was free from any misperceptions, misunderstandings, or misidentifications. Instead of feeling like a prisoner in an immobile and diseased body, my consciousness took flight. Later, he talks about how he's conquered, any of the other kinds of thinking. And then he says, I understood that the self, capital S, which is the screen of consciousness and whose fabric is our individual depth of love and wisdom, is what I eternally am. 
It's what we all are. The physical body is just a temporary vehicle for consciousness to explore the physical universe with. So that's from the book Supercharged Self-Healing. And I think you can understand why I thought you all would be interested in it. Well, if you just tuned in, you are listening to Noetic Moments here on KXCR. 90.7 on the FM dial, and streaming on kxcr.net. And that sound tells me we need to look at what's going on in the world today and what you, the listeners, are curious about. So what I want to talk with you about today are crows. Now, according to the Scientific American, crows are some of the smartest creatures in the animal kingdom. They're capable of making rule-guided decisions and of creating and using tools. They also appear to show an innate sense of what numbers are. Now, researchers are now reporting that these clever birds are able to understand how recursion works, that is, embedding a structure inside other similar structures, which has long been thought to be something only human beings could do. It enables us to build these long, elaborate sentences from the simple ones. Okay, their example, the mouse, the cat chased, ran. Here, the clause, the cat chased, is enclosed within the clause, the mouse ran. So the researchers at a lab at the University of Tübingen in Germany have looked at a number of studies with humans and monkeys to have shown a display with two pairs of brackets that appeared in random order. So this group at Tübingen went on to explore whether crows might possibly be able to do this. The crows performed on par with children. The birds produced the recursive sequences in about 40% of trials. And there you have it. Crows, monkeys, humans, we all are able to recognize when there is a sequence going on and someone pops something in the middle of it, and then we can continue the sequence. So next time you're watching the crows, see one crow is in the middle of doing something, he stops and does something else, and then goes back to what he was doing, continuing the sequence. That's recursion. Well, that's it for today's show. The next time we get together, we'll look at more of the research being done in an attempt to understand what consciousness is, what it really does, and how our lives will be very different when we use it fully. We are out of time for today, but remember, you can continue the exploration on our website, www.noeticmoments.org, where there's always a list of the videos that we've done with links and links to the books and titles and people that we talk about. And where you can send me, using the form, your comments and questions, which I'll do my best to get answered the next time we're on the air. For now, thanks for joining me here on Noetic Moments, recorded here in the KXCR Community Radio Studios in Florence, Oregon. And have a wonderful week. You've been listening to Dr. Ruth Miller's Noetic Moments. This program is produced in the studios of KXCR Community Radio in beautiful Florence, Oregon, supported by you, our listeners. Our theme music is Tumbling Planets, composed and performed by Jeff Lovejoy. To hear this program again or learn more about noetic sciences, search our website www.noeticmoments.org